It's a big world out there with plenty to do and explore. And there are a lot of big problems facing us right now, like pollution and global warming. Now is the time that we all should get together to help solve these problems. So where do we start? Well, the first step is learning all that we can about the Earth's problems. And then figuring out ways to solve them. We call that exploring. Right now we're going to explore water, water treatment. treatment. probably don't even think about it much, but water is one of the two most important things in your life. Without water and air, you simply couldn't exist. Did you know more than 62% of you is just water? Water is just about everywhere, and that's probably why we take it so much for granted. What we don't realize is that although water is a renewable resource, because it replenishes its over time, it is not as renewable as we may think. Water comes from two sources, under the ground where it collects in aquifers, and on the surface where we get it from lakes, rivers, and streams. Water renews itself through what is called the water cycle, as it moves from the air to the air through evaporation and then back to earth again when it rains. The problem is, as the world's population grows, so does the demand we put on our supply of water. But the supply doesn't always keep up. For example, in the United States alone, there has been a two-fold increase in population since 1900, but a six-fold increase in the amount of water we use. Water is being used up more quickly than it can replenish itself. And experts warn if we don't do something about it soon, we could run out. Humans have been trying to do something about water for centuries by storing and distributing it when and where it was needed. About 7,000 years ago, the people of Jericho, in the Middle East, learned to store water in cisterns. The Egyptians learned how to transport water by hollowing out palm trees. And in China and Japan, they used bamboo stalks. The Romans were the greatest builders of water distribution systems in history. They created a sophisticated network of dams that created lakes, then built aqueducts that carried the water to their cities. After the fall of the Roman Empire, however, the aqueducts fell into disuse, and water systems became highly unhygienic because human waste often crept into the water. People fell ill and often died. In 1804, a Scotsman named John Gibb was the first to build a plant specifically designed to clean up and reuse water for an entire city, Paisley, Scotland. Within three years, his filtered water was delivered all the way to Glasgow. Since then, we've learned a lot about taking care of water. Treatment plants have sprung up all over the globe. But still, we struggle to produce enough clean water for a thirsty world. The definition of water treatment is the process is used to make water fit for use by reducing contaminants in the water. Today, we rely on two main water treatment processes water purification, which takes the usable water already on the earth and recycles it so we can use it again, and desalination, a process that takes undrinkable seawater and makes it drinkable. Both these processes work on the principle of filtration. You can easily demonstrate how filtration works right in your own home or classroom. All you need are several items of different sizes and several different sized screens. Then you'll need two buckets with water in one of them. First, fill one bucket with the items you've collected. We've chosen a couple of tennis balls, some rocks, and sand with some dirt mixed in. Next, take the screen with the largest holes in it and hold it over the second bucket. Then pour all the items you've collected into it. You'll notice that the grate lets everything pass through except the largest items, the tennis balls. This represents the first step in a filtration process. Next, hold a smaller size filter over the first bucket and pour the contents back. The smaller screen separates out the largest objects but lets the smaller ones pass through. 
Do this with successively smaller screens until the final screen you use is a piece of cloth. The fabric mesh is now small enough to filter out just about everything you've collected. And what you have left is pretty much clean water. Basically, that's how a water treatment plant works. Only the plant uses powerful pumps that use a lot of energy, instead of just gravity to move water through the filters. This is Orange County Water District's huge purification plant in Fountain Valley, California. The largest water purification project of its kind in the world. Here, raw sewage is turned into 70 million gallons of drinkable water every day. Enough water for half a million people. How do they clean all that water? Like this. The process begins when sewer water arrives from a sewage treatment plant, where the major contaminants have already been removed. In a purification plant, treated wastewater undergoes a three-step process to make it clean enough to drink. Microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet light. Microfiltration, known as MF, has been used for years to purify baby food, fruit juices, and medicines. And it does it by using filters shaped like tiny straws. It's a very simple process. What we do is we use filters to filter out the bacteria. The filters look like hollow fibers or straws. And the holes or pores on the side of the membrane are so small that the bacteria is prevented from going through. The pores are actually 1 300th the size of a human hair, which is smaller than any bacteria. The analogy we use here is if you had a glass of soda with ice in it and you stuck your straw in that glass, as you sucked out all the soda, the ice is too big to go through the straw. Well, the same thing's happening here, but instead of ice, we have bacteria. So as we filter the water through these hollow fibers, the bacteria is staying on the outside while the water is passing on through to the next step. Reverse osmosis, or RO as it's called, the key to purifying water. Reverse osmosis is the heart of the treatment process. This is where we're actually forcing water through the molecular structure of a plastic sheet. In the RO stage, massive, powerful pumps force the water through rows and rows of high-pressure filters called RO membranes that have a special molecular structure. Hundreds of these special RO membranes clean the water so thoroughly that it comes out in pure, almost distilled condition. Uh, the membranes were developed to uh, initially desalt ocean water. Uh, but what we discovered in the 1970s is that you could do the same thing with treated wastewater. And it's actually a lot easier to treat the wastewater because there's a lot less salt than in the ocean water. And because of that less salt, it takes less pressure, which results in less energy. Finally, the water is treated with UV, or ultraviolet light and hydrogen peroxide. This process is similar to what is used in hospitals to sterilize instruments, and is like exposing the water to concentrated sunlight. If by chance a virus was able to get through, or an organic was able to get through the reverse osmosis process, the ultraviolet light in combination with the hydrogen peroxide could destroy those viruses or organics. From the outside, you couldn't actually see any of these uh, ultraviolet light bulbs, but they look like normal fluorescent light bulbs. And what we do is we expose or let the water flow across these light bulbs. If there is nothing in the water, the water will just flow on by unaffected. But if a virus was able to get through or an organic was able to get through the reverse osmosis process, the ultraviolet light in combination with the hydrogen peroxide could destroy those viruses or organics. So it's a multi-barrier or safety step that we employ in our process. From here, the pure, clean, treated water is pumped into percolation ponds where it naturally filters into the ground and blends with the groundwater. It can take a year or more before treated water is pumped out of the groundwater basin and re-enters the drinking water supply. Water purification uses a lot of machinery that consumes a lot of energy, but by recycling, we help extend the water available to us. However, experts fear that if our population grows as fast as it has in the past, there still may not be enough water to go around.
Take a look at a globe. Did you realize that nearly 80% of the Earth is covered with water? But most of that water is of no use to humans because it is salt water. Now, what if we could actually use all that salt water? Wouldn't that give us almost an endless supply and provide more than enough water for everyone on Earth? That's where the process of desalination comes in. Desalination could be a permanent solution to water shortages. There are already over 13,000 desalination plants around the world, producing more than 12 billion gallons of fresh water every day. The largest desalination plant in the United States is located near Tampa, Florida. It produces 25 million gallons of fresh water daily. It also uses reverse osmosis filtration, but in a slightly different way than in a purification plant. Because desalination plants process seawater, which comes from the ocean and can contain sand and other debris, salt water has to be pre-treated before the salt can be removed. It's years and years of trial and error and different, different things work and they don't work. Pre-treatment, there's a myriad of things that you can do pre-treatment, but the overall premise is to get the water clean of everything but the salt in the water before it goes on the reverse osmosis membranes. In our plant here, there's three stages of pretreatment, and they work off of each other, bet bettering the one before it. In the first stage, we add chemicals and we mix it rapidly, and the water gets slowed down and it travels through a series of basins, like a mice maze of concrete walls, and what happens in those basins is that chemical we added actually attracts the particles, uh, the solids, and I'm talking about sand, uh, some of the little tree branches, uh, anything that's in the water that you can see with the naked eye, uh, they clump together. This, this coagulant, this chemical acts like a glue. When the particles get heavy enough, they simply settle to the bottom where we can remove them. Then the seawater is sent to settling chambers where the engineers can monitor it as the smaller particles in the water settle out and are removed from the seawater. The next step is sand filtration where still smaller particles are filtered from the water. And how these work is the water from the first stage is introduced from the bottom. And air is taking sand and lifting it from the top. So water's coming in from the bottom and these sand particles are falling from the top. And when they collide, the dirty particulate that is in the water glues to the sand. And that sand becomes uh, dirtier as, as they say, we put that in a little uh, cleaner. It's, a, it's a, a tube that shoots the water up and throws it against the sides of a tube and the dirt falls off of it. We collect that dirt and we move it out of the plant and that's where the cleaning process takes place. See how clean that water is? Yeah. It's not even near ready to drink, but it's already so clear basically just from where we brought the water in. And then after that, it goes into what we call diatomaceous earth filters. And they are simply, uh, a lot of people have swimming pools. A lot of people have either a diatomaceous earth filter or a sand filter. And these are basically uh, large tubes in a vessel. If you open the, the lid of one of the, the diatomaceous earth filters, there's a series of uh, long nine foot, eight foot tubes that hang down, over 250 of them. And basically, we'll take a powdery substance called diatomaceous earth powder. Uh, it's made of diatoms, prehistoric microskeleton remains. We add water to it and then we pipe it into one of those vessels. That slurry, as I call it, that, that powdery, watery mix will attach to each of the candles on the outside. And that forms the barrier that will filter out any solids that got through the first two pretreatment processes. Once we've got the water clean out of the pretreatment process, we're ready to go and take the salt and the water and separate them. Salt is actually removed from seawater through reverse osmosis in the RO filters. During RO, very high pressure pumps force the seawater through semi-permeable membranes, which literally filter the salt out of the water. And that includes having to pressurize the water up to 1,000 PSI. That's a lot of pressure. Um, we pump it, we use a lot of electricity to do that. And the best way for me to describe how we're gonna do that is if we had a, a, a tub of water and I had in the middle of that tub of water a barrier that has small little holes that water can get through. 
if I had salt water on one side and pure water on the other side, and I didn't do anything but just sit there and watch it, the osmosis process will say that the water, the pure water, will flow and try to get into the salty concentration. What we're doing here is we're going to reverse that. So that's where we have to add this extra pressure. We're basically going to take and reverse what nature wants to do. We're going to push this water this way when it wants to go this way. And when we do that, these small pores will trap the salt, but the pure drinking water will get through on the other side. And that is as simple as what we're doing with these membranes. Each RO membrane pore is very thin, about 0.001 microns. That's about one one hundred thousandth the diameter of a human hair. It's one one hundred thousandth the size of a human hair. That's how small a particle has to be to get through. What's filtered out is concentrated salt and other minerals, which are pumped back out to sea. What's left is drinkable water. Chemicals are then added to stabilize the water, which is finally mixed with water from other sources before it is piped into your home. While desalination holds great promise, it has its drawbacks. Well, the number one disadvantage of desalination currently is the cost. And it's not so much to actually build a plant, it's actually to run it, to operate it. For one, treating water is expensive. It takes a lot of energy to run powerful pumps and a lot of money to maintain all that delicate equipment. We're making 25 million gallons of water. It cost us $25,000 just to pay the electric bill. There are over 10,000 membranes in the plant, each costing $600. And so if you add those together, that's a lot of money, $6 million worth of membranes. So desalinated water may not be affordable to everyone, especially in developing countries where drinking water is needed the most. Also, desalination works best in areas close to the ocean where there is a ready supply of seawater. It doesn't work well when you have to transport it deep into the interior of a continent or up into the mountains. It's going to become more and more of a, uh, something to fight over. Uh, wars could be started over, over the actual use of water, who has it and who doesn't. Uh, like I said, behind air, water is number two in supporting our lives. Water is and has always been important and it's only going to get more challenging to find good sources of water in the future. There's only a limited amount of water uh, on this earth and we have to make sure that we protect the water supplies that we have. And every day the, the, we keep getting more and more people on this globe and eventually we even need to do something or we're going to run out. So finding new and affordable ways to supply enough water for everyone on earth has become a priority and will surely keep inventors and engineers busy for decades to come. You know, there's still a lot more to learn about the world and what makes it go around. And it's never too late to explore. You might be surprised about all you can learn. Until next time, I'm Andrea. And I'm Michael. See you out there exploring.